Now let's talk about the Tony Awards. Okay, so the Antoinette Perry Awards. Ooh, that's so official. Named after a girl, yeah. obviously, um, are a reason to celebrate Broadway. And you know, if you've ever watched the Tony Awards, that the American Theater Wing, people come out and speak about the history of the Tony Awards, which are very illustrious, and they get a pretty decent amount of market share on CBS, so they continue. But why, why Tony Awards? And we've learned after a few years of being in the industry that the Tony Awards are really a love letter and a calling card for Broadway at large. Yes, you want your show to win. Yes, you want the actors who you just were swept away with their performances to win. But really, it's about the audience saying, wow, I should see a Broadway show. Which brings us to Broadway's tagline this past year, now go see a show, right? Now go see a Broadway show. Because what happens when they go to see, remember the year of Come From Away and Great Comet and Dear Evan Hansen that were all across the street from each other. And now what else is there? We've got Moulin Rouge across the street. And company is we've right got over there. Company there. And we've got Ain't Too Proud on 45th Street. So you go to see one show. And luckily, real estate is so crowded on Broadway, it will occur to you, this was a spectacular evening. Let me go see another show, another show, another show. Let's go back to the awards for just a second, just so maybe you guys can all relate to this, think back. I just remember being a kid and watching the Tony Awards and being like, I had never even seen a Broadway show yet. And the impact that that has, and it's like, you just, you just want to see it live. You want to be there. Now, we all know we are on an intermission right now. So so I ain't nobody's seeing anything live right now. However, we are, we will gear up, we will be back, and we will be live again. So the awards season is, is a huge deal. And why we wanted to talk about it tonight, did you even say this already? Is because, no. oh, is because today would have been, what's today? Yesterday. Yesterday would have been Tony the announcement knows. of all the nominations. So we wanted to honor that by doing a webinar about awards season. And talk about how every single person in our book got nominated. Yeah. Right? Including you. You are correct. Well, we were we were actually <laughs> jazzed for this season because we had Moulin Rouge and Jagged Little Pill and Company, which, you know, just got love letters from people, from audience members, from critics, from everyone. So that was a joy. And the Tony Awards are our biggest conundrum right now. And we have heard floating options from, okay, we're going to combine seasons 1920 and 2021. So we're going to have one giant Tony Awards ceremony next year that will encompass the previous two years of shows opening all the way to we're not going to have them televised, right? We're going to have them virtually the same way some of the other awards are just announcing, as we've seen in the past few days, we love all of these shows and we love all of these performers and congratulations. But the, the most important thing for the Tonys is that it gets people to a Broadway show. Now, how does a show get nominated? What do you have to do to be nominated for a Tony Award in particular? You have to open in a Broadway house. And that Broadway house has to have at least 500 seats. You've got 42 theaters to choose from. It is hard for many shows to get a Broadway theater. So just getting to Broadway is a big victory. I mean, that's the definition, you guys. It sounds kind of arbitrary and funny, but it has to be 500 seats or above to qualify as a Broadway house. And if you guys remember back on March 12th, I feel like when the Broadway League and the city together agreed to shut down shows that were 500 seats or above, that was super important for the Broadway community. Once the city shut us down, now we're eligible to hopefully receive insurance and maybe come back alive again. We had to wait for the city to say, we cannot have gatherings of more than 500 people. If we had elected to shut down, that would have knocked out our possibility to get insurance. So there's some stuff happening that were behind the scenes that a lot of people didn't know about. Now, there were profound artistic disappointments. I, I think the three hour window that the cast and crew of six had to undo their opening night, they were three hours away from opening when Broadway shut down. And our production of Moulin Rouge, we have a sort of an unusual schedule. We have a Thursday matinee. And our Thursday matinee was canceled just a few hours before that league announcement went public because we had ill company members. You guys may be aware of it. There, were, there was actually Danny Burstein who plays um, Harold Ziedler in Moulin Rouge, the um, MC, amazing guy, amazing performer, um, just amazing everything. Um, but he wrote a beautiful essay. You could find it if you just Google Danny Burstein and COVID-19, because he, he, he had it really bad. He ended up in the hospital, but it really ran its way through the cast. It was kind of a scary moment. So we were super on the front lines of, <laughs> of that happening. So we were the first show to actually call it because we, we were the only one, I think the only one with the matinee that day, at least for Broadway. 
So, and that night, that was it for everybody. Kind of a weird- On Broadway. Well, on Broadway. But on I will Broadway. tell you, I had seen this incredible off-Broadway show called All the Natalie Portmans. And I was uh. dying for my daughters to see it because it was just right in their pocket. And it starred this amazing luminous actress who we might be meeting a little bit later on. And that Thursday evening off Broadway was still happening. And so my daughters raced to the theater to a half full theater, although the, the show was completely sold out, but only half the people showed up and got a chance to see what ended up being the final performance of a very exciting All the Natalie Portmans. Oh, so crazy. So, well, speaking of off Broadway, so there's, you know, we've been talking about the Tony Awards, but then there's all these other awards that are, that are given out for off Broadway, off off Broadway, you know, there's regional theaters thrown in. There's actually, actually the Tonys recognizes every year one specific regional theater. Do you think awarded. they'll ever run out of regional theaters? That's always my concern. How many yeah, regional I hope, theaters? I, 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 especially now, I hope not, <laughs> you know? But um, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with any of this. So besides the Tonys, what else do we have? We have, we have the Drama Desk Awards. We have the OBs. Off-Broadway Alliance. Off-Broadway Alliance. I do like the Cheetah Rivera Awards, That's formerly for named the Fred Astaire Awards because that year that we were working on Cagney, Cagney got yeah, recognized yeah. and did a little tap number on stage and that was special. Right, the Lucille Lortel Awards. Okay. Uh, New York Drama Critics Circle Awards. I mean, this is, you said the Off-Broadway Alliance already, right? Yeah. Off-Broadway Alliance Awards. The Olivier Awards. And that's Or Oliver here. Awards, the depending on which side the, of the pond you're on. The Olivier's are West End's answer to the Tony Awards and we look Frequently, we look to what's happening in the West End to bring shows over here. And we did that with Angels in America, and then we did that with Company as well. That's Both right. of those shows started at the National Theater, got all the accolades, worked their kinks out. You know, one of the nice things about England is that they really support and underwrite their arts. So they can take a lot more artistic risks. Um, side note, I don't know if you guys have been watching, National Theater Live every week puts up these unbelievable, completely free, beautifully filmed performances of incredible shows. So they have Antony and Cleopatra coming up and Frankenstein starring Benedict Cumberbatch. And you know, if a name like that, he can get famous, you know that guy is gonna be good. Um, and I think Twelfth the Night. So if you have the chance to watch them, they come and go every week and they are stellar. And we can't help but notice some of those productions were like, how many people? are in that cast, that is downright yeah, irresponsible As for producers, Broadway. we're like, because if you guys were on one of our, especially, I think it was our first webinar that we did, we talked about, and maybe it was the last one, the size of a cast and what that means for the bottom line of a show. And yeah, we watched these and we're like, there's, <laughs> what, that's a lot of money. Oh, because they're funded. So my, <laughs> okay. my favorite new show over in the West End, it's not so new, it's a couple years old, it's called Everybody's Talking About Jamie. And oh, yeah. it's, it's somewhere like Kinky Boots meets Hairspray. It's joyous. You learn lessons. You root for the underdog. And they, they just announced today that the Australian tour of Everybody's Talking About Jamie is canceled for now. But what I'm interested in, that cast is enormous. It's an entire classroom of people. I can't wait to see, hopefully, what they do with Everybody's Talking About Jamie when it gets to Broadway. That's a plug. Get every what? <laughs> producer, producer, get that show. It's not our, it's not our show. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's just talk for a minute um, before we bring on our special guest, just about so like what's happening now because of this pandemic and with all the awards, like things are they're becoming abbreviated really, and the, really the biggest one that's on hold. I think you mentioned it earlier, it was, is the Tony Awards, which of course is the grand poobah of awards. That's like, it's part of an EGOT, guys. So, you know, it's, it's important, it's a big one. And it really, it, it could make or break your show in a lot of cases, you know, winning that, that- um, We should talk about that for a moment. What, how it can the make or break your show? The making or breaking Yeah, show. I mean, well, I'm just gonna say, you know, it's just say the, the award for best musical, you know, that could, that could mean you either stay open or close, whether you get it or not. Like, it's that powerful. However, there are always some outliers that even, I, th I always think about the show Wicked, which, you know, when it was the year, it was 2000, 2000 maybe? 2001, whatever year it was, um, it was up against Avenue Q, and Avenue Q won the Tony Award that year. But Wicked is still running, and they surpassed a billion dollars. Now, Avenue Q didn't do so badly, <laughs> I might tell you. However, it's just interesting that, 
even though it didn't win that award, it still became this huge, crazy success. And sometimes the Tony Awards can really amplify a show that only theater avids knew about. So specifically, I'm thinking Hades Town. Yeah. Last yeah, season, yeah, yeah. Hades Town swept all the Tony's award, awards. And I remember people even saying, Hades Town? Heads? <laughs> they didn't even know what the show was, how to pronounce it Aids. properly. And now, yeah. it, and then subsequently, after them sweeping the Tony's and having that beautiful, joyous performance on the Tony Awards, for a while there, you couldn't get a ticket. I mean, right. when it was running. That's and right. and then there's- It's still, and if it, you know, it was running right now, it's still one of the hottest tickets in New York. So who chooses Tony Awards? How do the Tony Awards get chosen, right? So, so there's about, uh, how many voters? Oh, about, about 850 voters. And they're from all across the country. You know, we have voters that are in places, and this is what a lot of people don't realize, from all the different regions. So you think about like shows go out on tour. So those voters might be looking, ah, what shows are going to tour well through my venue? So they may be looking at it through that lens, right? So then you take a show that is site specific or difficult to tour, such as Great Comet. And that, right, yeah. that, that theater was retrofitted for the show. And someone who has a regional theater out in the hinterlands is going to think, I don't know how this show could come into my theater easily. And then you contrast right. that with a show like Dear Evan Hansen, small cast, yeah. mostly um, video, right? That's the set, pretty mm -hmm, much. Mm -hmm. Is it, ooh, put, put it in two trucks and you're good to go. You can bring it anywhere. So these are the kinds of things that is a perfect example of where art and commerce are at odds. Because in a perfect world, you can't say, is the Van Gogh better or is the George Seurat better, right? Is right. Moulin Rouge better or is Jagged Little Pill better? It's, it's not about better. They're both beautiful and they're going to appeal to different people. So sometimes some of the voters will vote for where is it going to show up in my theater the most easily? And if it says best musical winner Tony Award this year, I'll be able to fill my subscription series a little more easily. You know, the, after uh, Hamilton, that small uh, little juggernaut won the Tony Award, show? there mm -hmm. were a lot of regional theaters and touring houses that um, anchored Hamilton and said, if you would like a ticket to Hamilton, here are the four other shows that are coming in that season that you need to buy a ticket for. And that was, it, right. and still is, right. has been until now anyway, a really incredible way to get people to see shows that they might not see because they don't have as much brand recognition or runaway success as Hamilton. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Can we talk about what it was like to go to the Tony Awards, please? Yeah. Tim, can we just? Okay, see so you guys, our first Tony Awards. That was great the year, comment. was it Great Comet great the year? Comment. So that was 2017. I'm not so good at the years. Yeah, but it was 2017. So we, yeah. so Great Comet had 16 nominations? It was, it had, Many. I think the most nominations of any show that season, or it was always tied with something else. So it was very, it was a very exciting moment. So guys, it's, yes, everybody wants to win a Tony Award, but the nominations is so exciting. It's also that sort of delicious time when so many people are involved and there's so much possibility. And, you know, all the nominees are going to like brunches and events and winning some other smaller awards along the way. So that was, when you finally did it. It was fun to going to everything. And, yeah. and the, the cool thing about it is when you're in the nominations race, and we'll talk a little bit a minute about what, what that looks like. When you're in the nominations race, it, everything is possibility. Everybody's a winner. So that's my favorite time. Yeah, between when the nominations are announced and the Tony Awards, when yeah. you're at the luncheons and, and you don't know who it's going to be. So you're saying, Josh Groban, I hope it's you. <laughs> but being, but you know, b being at the Tonys is super fun, of course. Everybody's dressed to the, to the nines. And, you know, I'm in a tux and Sue is in some like fabulous tux, tux as well. And um, it's just, it's, it's an evening where everybody is celebrated. And of course, it's like a reunion. You get to see all the other producers that you worked with through the years and all the performers are there. And it's just, Really, and the performers really that you've worked with in the past who suddenly are yeah. making their Broadway debuts and maybe even being nominated and you're yeah. just like, ah, oh, I remember when they were singing on a boat with me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's really awesome. What are you talking about? I yeah. can't imagine. Um, so, so Tony Awards, in incredibly exciting. But again, the, the way that I look at it anyway is it's for the industry. It is a calling card and a love letter and an advertisement for Broadway as an industry. And at the end of the day, if you look at it that way, it doesn't really matter who wins the Tony because frankly, so much of that is arbitrary anyway. If you are a co-producer on a show, 
chances are good that if you're a Tory voter, you're going to vote for your show. That's right. Mm. Like anything, there's, there's politics involved, of course, and you really do hope, you know, in your pure heart that everybody chooses the one that has the, you know, that's the art of it and the one that really deserves to win. It, exactly, because everybody has different tastes. Right. And this, so this year, y'all, for just for new musicals alone, it would have been a doozy. Can we do it? Mrs. Doubtfire. We, oh, you're talking six. about all the shows, even the ones that haven't opened yet. Yeah, the, okay, the ones yeah, that yeah. would have been nominated yesterday. Okay, let's six, see if you can do it. I'll fill which it is, in. seriously, people, the best workout music you have ever listened to. <laughs> you cannot help but dance. Okay. Six, Doubtfire, Tina, and that mm -hmm. Adrian Warren, who's insane. Um, oh, Moulin Rouge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jagged Little Pill. Um, Girl from the North Country. Oh, I wept my eyeballs out. What else? What Sing else? Street. Good. And they have something special. Percy going on Jackson there. and the Lightning Thief. The li which it's people just, seem it's just to called the Lightning it's, Thief. Oh, just the Lightning Thief. Thief. Okay, yeah. Okay. The Lightning Thief. Okay, so I want to tell you guys about the Lightning Thief. It was originally a theater works production at the Lucille Hotel. You know, they do free summer theater. Or they've done free summer theater every summer. And you sort of have to bring a kid with you because it's for kids. So I brought my kids and it dazzled me. It was so creative off Broadway. So I brought my kids again. This time only two would come with me. And then the third time I had to borrow other people's kids because I was so enamored of the show. And my kids were like, we saw it already. It was so creative. <laughs> I did not see it on Broadway. Um, but I, I also, you know, full confession here. I didn't want I didn't want a big, I don't know if it's a big production, but I just loved how it, it required your imagination. Yeah, it's magical. That performance. Yeah. Well, and I think there's another show that we're missing. Is there? That's a lot, though. And so you can have it. four or maybe five. And then the, shows. Well, then the revivals, of course. So West Side Story. There are only three. Company and Carolina Change. Carolina Change. Oh, no, there would have been four. No, you're right. <laughs> Never mind. Thank there would have been four. three for revivals. But no, I. Uh, oh, one more musical, Diana. That was oh, the other one. Right. It was literally, I think they did one or maybe two previews and got shut down. So that's just, that's heartbreaking. Man. And, you know, and, and Mrs. Doubtfire was into previews also. Um, Six was just about to open, you said. So it was, you know, Moulin Rouge, we, we said, you know, we started last summer. So we had, we've been running for quite a while, which is awesome. Um, but, you know, Jagged sort of just got started too. It just ran, just started running in. The girl um, from the North Country had just November. gotten that yeah. love letter review from the New York Times. And they were like, hey, we love you. Oh, okay. Goodbye, Broadway. Come back soon. Yeah. Oh, and so, anyway, how do you compare those? How do you compare something like The Lightning Thief with Girl from the North Country? Two completely different audiences, two completely different tones and styles and music. I mean, you can't. So you're going to go with A, what moved you the most? What shows do you have relationships with? And then what can actually do well in the future in licensing and in touring? So I think the bottom line when it comes down to award season is celebrate everyone, celebrate the people who win and celebrate everyone that's nominated as well, because we all win from that. Like yeah. it's, I mean, yeah, it's great to win it, but like not everybody's going to win it. So there you have it. You know so what we, I mean? There's only so much to go around. So I will tell you the best thing about winning a Tony award for me was, um, so we were all on stage for angels in America and there, you know, there's like a, a coterie of you. It gets up there. And I remember Eva Price grabbed my hand. She's just holding my hand while, and you can't really hear who's talking. Uh, Tony Kushner was talking, right. but we couldn't hear what he was saying. And then as like, one on mass, we all sort of went off stage, and I looked to my left, and it was Matt Bomer, and I looked to my right, <laughs> and it was John Leguizamo and Lee Pace, who I, yes, oh, is it was that later? Maybe that was I later. We were sandwiched crush. between the two of them. I have had a talent crush on John Leguizamo ever since I saw Freak at like Playwrights Horizons when he before he yeah. was anyway, and I'm like just chatting with John Leguizamo like it's a normal thing. That was more exciting than getting the actual Tony Award. Don't tell John. Oh, tell John. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you okay. can tell him. You can tell so him. now let's talk about uh, Tony, what the Tony season is like for someone. We've only been nominated, y'all, with our shows, which is a very different animal mm -hmm. than getting nominated as an individual for a performance because suddenly, and I'll let Montego tell this part of it because it was her experience, suddenly the whole world knows who you are and it's quite extraordinary. So to set up, one of my favorite performers of all time. You have seen Ms. Montego Glover on Broadway as Fontaine in Les Mis, covering and then going on for the epic role of Seely in The Color Purple. You have seen her, if you are lucky enough to be in or live in Chicago, 
she played Angelica in Hamilton for over a year. That was not, not good for our personal <laughs> relationship. I missed her. And then, of course, her Tony nomination was for the, the joyous and celebratory role of Felicia in Memphis. And before we bring on Ms. Montego Glover, we'd like to show you what a Tony-nominated performance looks like. Yeah, you guys need to see this. Are you sharing your screen? I'm going to share a Larry's little bit with you all. Larry's going to do fancy things. I am. So hang on a second, guys. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. <laughs> It's gonna happen. I want her maximized. Yeah, I'm maximizing. So, Don't worry. You guys, watch guys. the red dress. It's everything. Here we go. So great. Well, let's print her on, man. That's awesome. I don't know where it went, <laughs> but uh, we got we got to shut that down because it's somewhere on this computer. Hold on, guys. I wouldn't mind seeing it again. <laughs> I don't think we need. To, here we go. Here we go. There it is. No, that ain't it. Well, Where? I mean, we could seriously just go through the entire album. That's fine, too. See, this is what happens when you have a... Oh! Uh, <laughs> oh <laughs> All right, gang. So, uh, let's bring on Montego, shall I we? I think with an introduction like that, I, mean, I hope she's wearing the red dress now. Maybe she changed costumes. All right, let's see if we got Miss Montego. Yay. There she is! Whoa. Can we hear her? Hello? Hey, hey! Hi, beauty! <laughs> Montego, we are so honored to have you with us. And what I remember most about your Tony Award year is us joking about how you were like, yes, instant fame, only five or six years in the making. <laughs> Will you take us through your journey with Memphis? Uh, yes, yes. So, <laughs> uh, about... Mm, six years before we arrived on Broadway. So that would have been season 2009, 2010. I uh, had just worked on a show at the North Shore Music Theater to uh, great success. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but I had been there like two or three times and it had gone very, very well. And my agent sent me a script and he said, it's for this piece called Memphis. And I said, okay, he goes, it's new. The artistic, the then artistic director for the North Shore Music Theater had seen this piece in a reading and wanted to do it at the theater. And they were very interested in having me play the role. And since I had just done a play there and it went really well, this, is, this made sense. So I read it and I remember thinking, wow, there's a story here to tell. Mm. There's a story here to tell. So I read, I read the script and I said, yes, I'd love to do it. And I met with our creators, David Bryan and George DiPietro and producers. And that was the beginning of Memphis happening. And what we realized is that we knew the heart of the story, but we had more ways we wanted to expand it and really workshop it and give it a, a lifetime to really grow. So over those six years, basically every other year, every year and a half to two years, we would pick up the piece again. So we did it at North Shore and then we took it out West for a couple of um, uh, uh, productions and then we brought it back. And it was 
um, an opportunity to revisit the piece. And then in the time we were working on other things, I felt like I had an opportunity to grow as an artist and as a woman and as a person. And then I had more life to bring back to the piece. Um, mm -hmm. And then we realized probably in the four productions that we did out of town before we were coming in, oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, you gonna, guys, I just I just have to say I hope everybody get that six years it actually sounds kind of short from because <laughs> we talked before we talked about Moulin Rouge being 10 years in the making and then you know Dear Evan Hansen was eight years in the making so so six years is a long time but in the grand scheme not too shabby it's, it's one year for every letter in Memphis right <laughs> hey, I can't spell yeah. there's an extra <laughs> Memphis it's Memphis. Okay. Oh, you got. You also have to tell them. I, I don't know if everybody caught. Um, wait, what's his name? Brian. Um, um, David, David Brian. David Brian. Thank you. Who he is? Because I think that's <laughs> interesting for people who may not know. Oh my goodness. David Brian is our composer from Memphis. He is also um, one of the founding members of Bon Jovi. This little band. You may have heard of it. <laughs> yes. And he loves to write songs. Not only is he a terrific um, composer, but he loves to write lyrics and he um, had always been toying with a few things, you know, to play with. He and Joe found each other and it was kismet straight away. They really were amazing to work with individually and as a as a duo, you know, a co-lyricist and then composer. Was it and of course, Joe wrote the book for the show. Was it based on anything? Is it fact-based? Is there a story first? Yes. Or? Yes. Um, based on a DJ in Memphis in the 1950s, whose name was Dewey Phillips. Dewey Phillips put Elvis on the radio for the first time. Mm. And he was quite responsible for putting what, what was then called race music, music made by black people on mainstream radio. Because before then, they had like very tiny little frequencies at the very end of the dial. And he was responsible for bringing them into the main so they could be heard by everyone, which is the story that we wanted to tell. We wanted to base um, Huey Calhoun, who was the leading man in the show, we wanted to base him on Dewey Phillips. Yes, a real guy. Was Felicia a real girl? No. <laughs> <laughs> we made her. <laughs> so how long between your last out of town tryout and okay guys, we got the green light, we're going to Broadway, we got a theater? Um. Let's see, we did our last out of town at the Seattle Fifth Avenue. Before that, we were at La Jolla. And that was probably from Seattle to New York was probably six months altogether. It just took that long to finish up those bits and you know see what the show really was and be sure that we knew which theaters we wanted to have. And I, will, I do remember this. Um, you know, when you put together a piece, um, the houses on Broadway, in my opinion, are all gems of their own. They have different personalities, they have different energies, um, different sizes, and depending on what your play is, there's a perfect fit for every single piece that goes up on the Broadway. And I remember thinking, it would be so amazing if we got the Schubert, it would be so amazing. And I remember Chris Ashley, our director, calling me at home and going, we got the Schubert. Yeah. And I screamed. <laughs> In my living room, I screamed. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and but, then there were. Because it's so, it's so true. So many times, producers have to, you have to have like three or four theaters that you're willing to go into. And it's like, yeah. a, shoot, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, so see, I mean, up until, we'll see what it's like when we get back. But up until now, it's it's been harder than ever. Yeah. You know? really so I want to I wanna talk about what it was like. You got into the theater. Everybody went crazy over you. <laughs> I, I mean, you they know, did. I, it's true. It's a thing. Um, they went crazy over Memphis, obviously, best musical. But what was it like when you went from a working actor, a, a recognized, celebrated, acknowledged working actor to, oh, my God, it's Felicia from Memphis? Um, it was it was a larger responsibility and a larger presence and a real opportunity for me to um, get to, to, to reach people and get to know them through this piece, but also get to know them like a, as an individual. Like one of my favorite things is coming out the stage door after a performance and just meeting our audience. Anybody who you know wants the stage door 
and wants to spend a second saying hi or, you know, get a playbill sign or something. I really appreciate that because during the run of the play for that evening or that matinee, you're uh, sharing something so personal. I'm sharing something so personal about me, which is my art. And so that coupled with getting to introduce people to Montego is, uh, is the it feels like the right um combination and so that was the biggest thing like oh i get to now do both of these things on such a grander scale the most grand scale i've ever done it in my career to that point because you know it was it was my first lead role on a broadway show first lead role first tony nomination yes now having said that my first broadway show was the color purple the original company, the original production. And I joined that company as a standby. So I remember like also going on for Celie and Nettie, which are the roles I covered, like for the first time being like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm the person out front tonight. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so it was interesting to like have that first experience be joining a company as a replacement. And then the next experience being, you have created this thing and now you're going to put it on the deck for the first time. And that was, yeah. I, I remember some, were you a part of Felicia, the development of the character and things she said and where she walked and how she sang things and her level of color in the development yes. process? So it was yes. really such a, really a combination of everybody's skills. Exactly what you hope for as an actor is not just that you create the role, but you also create who Felicia is. Yes, I gotta say, Joe and David, are extraordinarily generous with their words and their notes. I don't mean notes to actors, I mean like actual dots on a page, music. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were, they were, they made it easy to collaborate. Um, and because we were making something that was new, there was no, there was no rule book that said it has to be this way. All we really needed to commit to was making the best possible version of these people and the world that they lived in and the way they spoke and moved through space and interacted with one another. That was the only um, job. And Chris Ashley, our director, I mean, come on. He knows how to get there. Yeah, he did things with chairs and come from away, so. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I don't know how you did it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then Tony nomination day, did you have an inkling? No, I was, I, I was so excited that we were, we had worked so long and so hard on this piece and we were, we've done, it was, it was our best work. We had, we had the opportunity to put forward our best work for this piece, you know what I mean? So the fact that we were getting to put it on a Broadway stage on the one that we really, really, really hoped we'd get and it was being well received was everything. Like truly, I, I, it, not in a million years if somebody had said to me when I was a wee lass in acting school or something, you know, it's gonna go like this. <laughs> I would have poo-pooed that whole thing. <laughs> Where were you when you, when you got the, the news? When you truly? saw the nominations being read, like, yeah. Uh, you, want, you want the truth? You want the real tea? You want the real tea? Down and dirty. <laughs> <laughs> we have worked so hard long hours putting up a new play anywhere especially on broadway a new musical long hours um really really like leaned in and intense i was dead asleep <laughs> in my bed i heard no nominations read in real time not even a little bit like every hour i could close my eyes i was taking it because we were working really hard getting the show up you know what i mean and getting and running it and so my phone rang it was my publicist and she was screeching into the phone um to tell me that my name had just been read <laughs> so exciting yeah it was the call. I had no, I, honestly, I might have gone through that entire day and not have gotten that information until I sat down to read the novel, you know what I mean, to read the novel myself. But yeah. So, so now right. when that happened, then, you know, like we were mentioning before, it gets into like full on like brunches and lunches and events. <laughs> and what was that like to balance, you know, doing the show eight times a week and then having to go to all these events all of a sudden? Right. Well, the thing is, it's such an incredible honor and it's, it's really rare when you think about it, like what it costs to make a piece of theater and how um how theater in my opinion is such a full contact sport you know what i mean so like 
when, when the work is recognized, either as an individual or as a group or the piece itself, it's just tremendous. So the, the first thing you really do have to recognize is that you are shifting gears. You're now going to continue to do the work of making the art, but then there's this whole other thing that needs to be honored, which is the recognition from you know, our industry for the work that you're doing. So it requires a great deal of planning and thinking ahead. You have to have help. And if you're not accustomed to accepting help or or asking for what you need, this is the that's the process that'll get that'll get rocky for you because it's just a lot to carry. Eight performances of anything in six days every week, week in, week out, is intense. And then adding an entire award season on top of it is is a big one. So my publicist, my entire team, you know, agents, manager, publicist, um, business manager. <laughs> everyone, attorney, like everybody, you know what I mean, involved in keeping me up and moving because the bulk of my work was about making sure that the performance stayed where it should be and was continuing to grow. Because of course, now that you're nominated, the nominators are coming out to see the show and all the other awards um, nominators are coming out to see the show because the race is on now. So you wanna be sure that you preserve it, but you also wanna participate in celebrating the fact that you got there. And it's so, so the first thing you do, of course, is get ready to meet the press. It's so it's such an exciting thing. You know, you're nominated for a Tony Award, and the next morning or two days later, you gather at one of those incredible giant hotel set up ballroom situations in Midtown Manhattan, and every possible outlet on the planet is there, and you're going to spend the next three or four hours meeting every single member of the press. We're so, I, I, just from a producer standpoint, we're so grateful for that because <laughs> you can't pay for that kind of stuff. You it's know incredible. what I mean? It's really a yeah. magical time. I think for everybody, like obviously yeah. for you, the performer who's just like finally getting all the accolades that you deserve and that you've earned <laughs> and you worked so hard for. But then us as producers, it's like, okay, we because we worked hard too to get it to that <laughs> point. You know? I mean, we're not out there doing it eight times a week but we're like doing all the behind the scenes stuff. So to get that sort of recognition, it's, it's just so exciting. It is, it is. And it's a celebration that day. It's like the, the energy in the room was and continues to be, I think, electric. You know, everyone from the outlets is so happy to be there. We're happy to be there. You know, any person who can like stand against the wall and just watch it all happen is happy to be there. Like it's, it's, it's thrilling and it's the first event after the names are read, the nominations are out, where, where you're gonna gather in, in a large group because there are gonna be so many more large group gatherings, but like that's the first time and it's like, wow, this is happening. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's like an accumulation of time also where there's so much marketing happening and so much press happening that um, it really, again, whether win or lose, it's like all that build up stuff is what can really get a show to run for years and years because there's all the, the spotlights are on it. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, on the individual performers, I mean, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Montego, I don't think you're the right person to ask this question, but I just have to. You are so polished. You don't just do Broadway, you also do TV and have this enormous concert career. But throughout that whole Tony Awards nomination process, did you ever have a giant gaffe where you were like, totally shouldn't have said that, totally tripped on my gown, totally, <laughs> you know, like, did you have a moment that you were like, oh yeah, okay, you messed that up, way to go. <laughs> I'm trying and to think. Who has a lot of them she can lend it's you? It's true, I do. <laughs> <laughs> One, or <two>. <laughs> <laughs> One or two gaps. I'm trying to think. I can't think of anything that like where I where I ran into a wall or some like I I you know I mean I tripped on my own foot, but I did have a moment. I will share this with you because it it <laughs> if I had a gap, this probably was the moment. So I'm meeting the press. It's been a very, very wonderful but it's been a long day you know been up very early on all the stuff um and doing a lot of you know talking about my work and the piece and all that's wonderful it's the very 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 end of the day very last and this um uh reporter uh like begged my publicist like begged my publicist like pull like pulling on her sleeve you know what i mean like please 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 wanted to talk to me wanted to talk to me wanted to talk to me and she was like okay, Montego, are you okay with this? And I was like, yes, of course, of course. So he comes over, he sets up and he says, so how does it feel to play Denzel Washington's wife? <laughs> I don't know, but I'd like to. <laughs> and my face like 
Lord in heaven. <laughs> he thinks I'm Viola Davis. We are in the same Tony class. <laughs> Alas, I'm not she. I love her. I'm very flattered. My brain <laughs> all these things well my face was like <laughs> and so i said good. so when everything finally caught up you know what i mean brain caught up to face caught up too i said i think you're looking for viola davis and she's right over there i'm not viola <laughs> he like god oh it was oh the look of the <laughs> crack, 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 crack. horror on his face and i wasn't mean or nasty i promise that's so not me but I was like, how do I tell him that he has made a massive mistake? Maybe you should have just gone with it and like made up a whole like, just been Viola Davis and like made some crazy story about Denzel. I don't know. Oh my God. I was like, okay, I'm flattered, but she's right there. He just, you know, wires crossed, wires crossed. There was a moment I was like, it was silent between the both of us. He didn't want to talk to you after that? You didn't say Sorry. Well, then he was like, oh, oh, oh. And then he was, he really, he was like, what? He, he thought he knew who I was. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But by then it was, it was, it was, he was trippy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he was, so Tony he Awards did. night. Yes. Tony Awards night, they ask a lot of you because you're coming in uh, full on nerves, but then you also have to perform in front of the world live talk us through how that actually works what are the logistics of getting all of you on stage and then you into your primo seat because you're a nominee yes it is a massive operation for um the production and for the crew at radio city uh for every single human involved in the show and the crew is a massive tony sunday is a massive production for which as you well know pre-planning goes on for many many weeks including if you're nominated for a musical or as a performer or whatever, what you're going to perform and what version from the show and blah, 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 blah. It's like all the logistics. So Tony Sunday, however, is a big one because of course shows have performances, but the awards themselves are also airing. So you're up very, very, very early in the morning, having gone to bed at best at midnight the night before to do camera blocking and all of that at Radio City in full costume and makeup because you have to see the whole thing for the live telecast. And then you go away and you sleep maybe for an hour in your dressing room and you come back <laughs> and you get ready to actually attend the Tony Awards. Um, and you get an aisle seat if you're a nominee so that should your name be called, you can easily get from your seat uh, to the stage. And I remember going for rehearsal and there are these, um, they have these great placards that sit in the seat that have like your face and your name <laughs> and like your maybe ticket number or something on it. Your face and Viola Davis's name. So <laughs> weird. Just so crazy guys. Um, and that's really cool when you look out and you go, oh, oh my God, I'm looking at my own face. That's my seat. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And then you get, you really get yourself together because you've got to represent the show. But also if you're nominated as an actor or actress, this is a, a a singular light that is on you too. You're sharing it with your company, but you also have a bit of light that's just shining on you, you know? So it's always the performance happens. And this is how we know that it's done, that you guys, the cast buses in, right? <laughs> You're hanging out on a bus because there's not enough room for the entire company. You get there's on not. the bus, you, you go two blocks to Radio City, you get off the bus. Thanks forever. <laughs> And then did you change into your gown backstage at Radio City or did you go back to your home theater? No, so um, you leave the theater in your bus, you go. I got dressed um, at Radio City. Um, no, that's not true, that's not true because I'm, I'm ahead in the program. I got dressed at the theater for the ceremony. When you get there, you do arrival photos and you sit, but then you're gonna perform, in which case you're gonna wear your costume. So then someone very lovely comes and asks you to please follow them to <laughs> a place where you are set up in a dressing room with a lot of other you know, leading ladies. Everyone has a station and every, for every one person, there's a gaggle of humans um, moving around them to take off you know, their jewels that they wore and their beautiful gowns that they did arrivals in that they're actually wearing to the ceremony to put them in their costume and their wigs. So this was me, my dresser, my hairstylist, my makeup artist, and my stage manager were all 
my team and every single one of us, you know, um, appearing or performing or nominated um, in the awards that year were in the room together. I mean, we're having a lovely time, but you're also being pulled and tugged on by a number of hands <laughs> getting you in and out of things so that you can, you know, go and go and perform and then come back and take all of that off. All my Felicia Farrell comes off so that I can put Montego Glover back on, including my beautiful red gown and the ushered light, lightest air back to your <laughs> so that you can then, you know, continue to enjoy the program as if you've never left. And what does it feel like when you're performing sort of in the safety of Felicia Farrell, because you've been doing it eight shows a week and you trust your company and you're part of the company and you created the thing, but also knowing underneath that, I'm, I'm going to be sitting down and there's a chance they might call, they will definitely call out my name. And <laughs> yes. They'll definitely have the camera on me, 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 just me yeah. later. Did it affect your performance and the fact that the performance was televised in front of everyone on the planet? It, it, it didn't because I felt like we were ready. We were rehearsed. We were excited to be there, but it was, there was an awareness that, um, the, there were fans of ours and fans of the show out there in the country and around the world who were taking this in with us, mm -hmm. this singular experience. They may not have even seen Memphis yet in the theater, but for so many people, this is going to be, this performance is going to be their introduction to the show. Um, I know this because as a wee girl in the Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm -hmm. like perched in front of the TV, watching the Tonys every year, I was like, wow, like I got, I got introduced to all these shows that I, I wasn't going to necessarily be able to see on Broadway because I was a little kid and we hadn't gone to New York for a big trip yet. But it was, it was like this parade of like wonderful sounds and dancing and, and all these different kinds of shows. And I thought, this is the moment. I'm now inside the TV and someone else is like in their living room and they're being introduced to this thing called Memphis which may very well end up being one of their favorite pieces or might very well be their first experience when they actually go to Broadway. I cannot tell you how many fan letters I get and continue to get, and it's been 10 years since we made Memphis, and people say to me, it was my first Broadway show. Gosh, Memphis was amazing. First and when Chattanooga, Tennessee must have gone bananas when they started <laughs> that, on that program with that red dress. I mean, you start, we didn't have time to show the whole program, but you can see it on YouTube. You start that entire scene speaking mm -hmm. yeah. close up on the two of you looking so beautiful. And I will tell you, every one of Felicia's lines and her journey throughout the show, you just, it, she, she has extreme ups and extreme downs and you just made her so immediate and relatable and you can see it on great performances, right? It's on PBS, yeah. yes? Yeah. Yes, and Broadway HD, the show is there. And, oh, very good. So I let my kids, I didn't bring them to the show because they were too little, but we let them see everything except the scene where you get beat up, which nobody yeah. talks about, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we, we watched all of it on great performances, and we just turned that part off, yeah. just FYI, in case there's a missing in the storyline when my kids talk to me about it. Um, uh, we're going to ask Montego in the future to only perform in shows that are age appropriate for my children. <laughs> then it does. Time, Felicia's amazing journey, every single person who saw Memphis was able to find their way in, I think, to the show through you. you oh, oh, that's really sweet of you to say, Sue. That's really sweet. Yeah, and, and accurate because you got to talk. I mean, I wasn't the only person who, who was voting that year for Tony nominations. Other people were too. Now let's talk about why Montego did not win her first Tony Award. I want to tell you guys why. First of all, it's not fair to make a Broadway debut in a brand new show and be nominated and win all the same. You have nothing to look forward to in your life. Okay? It's all the deal from there, maybe. Because there's another one in your future that's going to be that's going to be the one. But also, back in the day, before they were really tracking all the Tony nominations and who went to go see everything, if you didn't see every single show and you saw Catherine Jones' name, I think that was an easy check mark. But if every Tony voter mm. had seen Mo Memphis, girl, we'd be shining that Tony Award together right now. <laughs> well, I appreciate your kindness. I really do. What's amazing about that process is that I didn't really understand what these words meant until I was in that space where there are five of us in the category, Catherine, myself, and others. And 
you realize that the it's it's a beautiful thing to win an award. I have awards myself. Where are they? Why aren't they behind you? Uh, because they're 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 facing that way. <laughs> you know, John Legend has all of his. Have you seen him? <laughs> If him on Zoom, it's like sitting with his awards. <laughs> awards. Um, I would too. You know, yeah, I have awards myself. So I know what that feels like for you to be the person who's like the trophy is in your hand. But what I also know is that it really is, and it sounds cliche, but it's not. It really is an honor to be nominated. It really is. Like having the trophy is like the cherry on top. So like you could have a cherry and not have a cherry, but the fact that like you have the cake and the icing and the experience of eating it. Well, I will say also, in my opinion, and maybe you'll agree with me, I think the women's categories are always the toughest and the most yeah. competitive because there are so many incredibly talented <laughs> just women. Just women are better than men? And, yes, they are. <laughs> and there's, there's less roles. I mean, yeah, it's changing. Things have gotten better. Fewer but... roles and women are more... Uh -huh. culturally women are raised more to sing more and dance more and so when you're auditioning for a Broadway show I would say the women's uh, the competition for women is no less than 10 times more than the men absolutely I think, you know women come women come to play they come and when I say play I mean they come to like do it do it well do it right particularly in my opinion if you're at that level um, acting or acting and singing because it's rare air we breathe again it's not easy work and if you have roles that are that are robust and challenging and have like range, it, it's not for the faint of heart. And you need to be the right kind of elite athlete mm -hmm. to make that to make that work. I love those challenges. Mm -hmm. I was built for those. I just want to remind everybody um, if you want to ask any questions of Montego or anything around we have some. awards and all. I know we have like some. Wait. We have some uh, questions about awards. No, but I want to. I want to ask the Montego e questions. Okay, so Montego, how did this change your career? How did the Tony nomination change your career afterwards? What new doors were open to you? Ah, uh, how did it change my career? What doors were open? First of all, um, the Tony Award is a, is like the most one of the most respected awards, like probably one of the highest, the highest honor in the theater. So having the moniker of Tony Award nominee is like living under a golden a golden banner <laughs> that never 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 stops being yours it's like a constant light and I mean spotlight like look at me look at me I don't mean that I mean like a constant light mm -hmm. that you are responsible for this is my opinion that I'm responsible for that I earned that I'm happy to have but it's most certainly mine and so Anytime it's said or used, you have to embrace it. If you're the kind of actor who doesn't, um, who shrinks with that, or you, you, you have trouble sort of really fully standing in your space, once you have a Tony nomination, you really don't have a choice. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So like reach up and grab it, because that's the thing. Do you know what I mean? That's part of you. That's you know really I mean? beautiful to hear, I have to say. That's really, because um, I feel like that's what it should be about. Yeah. You know. And I, I don't want to be clear. I don't mean like, look at me, wave a thing around in people's faces and so on and so forth. Not that. Quite the opposite. It's something much deeper and it works on levels that are connected to your actor's heart, to your mm. spirit, to your skill set, to your sense of community, your sense of self mm. as an artist. Mm. Like that's, that's important. It was all, it, so that was a thing that changed for me. Um, and I joined a group of people who had, this, who have the same golden arc. Do you know what I mean? So here, I'm now in this, this group. I'm breathing this air now. Mm -hmm. um, and how did my career change? Wow. Um, it's, it's, it's <laughs> again, it's like, you've been on television, like doing the thing. Oh, you know what I mean? People have seen the show. I was standing, I remember absolutely standing on a sidewalk and I was looking at my phone and I looked up and a bus went by and I watched my own face go by on the side of a bus. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> that was weird. Like that's never happened before. Like my, my face was on the side of New York City bus, like, you know what I mean? Or in the subway, um, uh, seeing ads for the show. And it's just like, you know, our logo or my face and Chad's face, you know what I mean? Together. I really made it when someone drew a mustache on you in the subway. <laughs> there you go. And then I got graffiti and I was like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, graffiti, yay. Did you ever um, stand in front of your own you and just look back and look and look and other <laughs> people would look and be like, like wait, a, wait a moment, lady. 
<laughs> yep, there, I've had a couple moments. I have a funny story about that, and I'll tell you uh, in just a second. The other thing, too, about career is that since now that I have this moniker and the others, um, people people uh, want to, uh, what's the word? People have a sense that I am serious about my work and they want, they always did, but they very much want to know that I want to be in the room or invite me in the room. And I appreciate that. I appreciate people recognizing what it means to have them and to want to work with artists who do. Because I certainly had the great privilege of having it before and now it just takes it up that much more and you have to be really willing to lean into that. Because again, um, if you don't, you know, you're missing opportunities to, to further your skill set and make your career the kind of thing that you're really proud of, you know. Um, so I'm going to tell you this, <laughs> this story about like, um, <clears throat> like standing next to a thing or somebody thinking like that, you know, they saw you, but then they also saw you like in front of them and also on this other thing. So I'm sitting on the subway after a show going home and this guy is sitting across the subway car and he's looking at me and smiles and then he smiles again. And then he comes over and he says, has anybody ever told you that you look just like Montego Glover? <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> oh, you do, you really do. And I said, well, thank you. He goes, that's a compliment. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And he goes, yeah, no problem. And he goes and he sits down. And then next stop we get, doors open, he gets off. And the minute he was off, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I had to tweet it. I was like, oh, wow. I just reminded someone of myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought what he was going to say was, you look like Montego Glover, and you say, oh, wow, and he goes, and you sound like her, too. <laughs> Anybody ever told you look just like Montego Glover? No. I just want to just, just point out one thing that you guys, I don't think you, you haven't mentioned yet, is how the two of you, because you guys have a history, Montego and Sue. We go way back. You want to tell that like, quick, just quick, so everybody can hear about that? Because I think it's super fast. Because the reason why I say is because on our very first um, producer webinar, we talked about your network and we talked about people lead to people, lead to people, lead to people, mm -hmm. and just everything you do in life. It's like you always want to leave a great impression, and it's relationships you build along the way that build your future. Yeah. So, yeah. how did you guys meet? Okay, so I arrive in New York City. It's my first. Um, Inside my first six months, I get here, and my friend Kevin, who I went to college with, calls and says, hey, we just lost our leading lady on the show I'm working on. He goes, and I know they're looking for someone. I recommended you. And I was like, okay. And it's this off-Broadway production of the Pirates of Penzance, totally reimagined, also happening on the deck of the ship Peking at South Sea Street Seaport, and it's immersive. I was like, it's everything. It's got all the stuff. So, that was like, before like immersive theater became the thing. That was, you were ahead of the curve. It was, it was unheard of. Pirates of Penzance, completely reimagined. Like just downtown, on the deck of a ship, no doubt. Like it, what? It doesn't get any better. So I went down, I sang for the role of Mabel. I got the offer for the role of Mabel. And who do you know is in the cast as a member of our acting company, one Miss Sugila? <laughs> I was one of the people who actually got to push the audience around. It was so immersive <laughs> that they all moved from corner of the ship to corner, and I pushed them from place to place. And I also covered. Somebody thought it was a good idea to make me a swing. That was a show I learned that I should never ever be a swing. We did four different tracks, and basically the company was so gracious. Whenever I went on for someone's role, they would just push me to where I needed to be <laughs> at that moment. I loved that show. We had so much fun. Oh, much. And I'll tell you guys, this is how I always remember what year it was. Those were the days when you only had to work 10 weeks to get your insurance for a whole mm. year Montego. And we, I was talking about baby making. And that summer while I was doing my 10 weeks of Pirates of Penzance, I got Carregers. And I was like, oh, great. Got my insurance. I got to go, you guys. I'm pregnant. Gotta get out. <laughs> we were like, yay. Oh my God. <laughs> 
Uh, it was such a magical time and it was summertime. And so every night in the show, we could see all the South Street Seaport people. And my husband, uh, would I would hear his motorcycle during the final vows crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. So I would <laughs> get ready to get going. <laughs> Oh man, that was so much fun. But it you was. never know, you never know who's gonna end up being a showmance or a show friend for life. Yes, and here we are, seriously. What's like years and years later, here we are. You know, Sue talks about this all the time, like all the people that we did, you know, summer stock with early on in our careers. And we, you know, we, cause we used to be actors. Um, and- We were brilliant. The, we were we were brilliant. We were brilliant. There are no it was recordings. The day before VHS. Few uh, <laughs> <laughs> recordings. Um, <laughs> but then, oh where was I going with that? Oh, it's so it's it's those all those people from that time. They're now the power players. You know what I mean? They're the they're the Tony nominated actors, and they're the producers, and they're the, running the advertising agencies. So for anybody who's young watching this, and you may be just getting into this business. Um, or you're still in college or whatever, just remember that. That can be your crew. Those are the people you're gonna rise up with and become, because yeah. right now it's like, wow, all, all these other people run the show. But eventually, if you want to, you'll be the one running the show. Yes, provided you have a, you know, a goal and, and um, uh, you are actively contributing to where you're going with your career as a producer, as an actor or anything. Like yeah. you have that goal and you're working toward it and you're really thinking about your choices and how you conduct yourself and what things you say, don't say, when it's something appropriate, when it's not, you know, just making your relationships, being, being very aware of that. And I don't mean in a fake way. I mean in a way that is like an investment in your own talent and your own career, no matter what you're trying to do, right? Speaking of your own career, Montego, while we are all in temporary captivity, what can we see you on in this small screen? There's a bunch, right? Yeah, there's some stuff that went onto the small screen before we went into captivity. So if you missed it, now's a great time, for example. Um, Bull, season four, you'll catch me in there. Little, little uh, you know, uh, attorney action, just giving you some sensible courtroom. Um, and uh, I've been talking to you, obviously, on the television and the radio in the world of voiceover. So, you know, if you happen to catch a sound that sounds like me, it probably is me. Um, <laughs> and if I had only stayed on longer, he would have known. I would have known. <laughs> and totally. Smash, we have to mention Smash. Oh, Smash. It's like, you know, <laughs> like that faraway place that we're like, oh, right. We're all that Everything about set. Smash. I bought it. It's just, you know, honestly, I have such fond memories of set because it was like, we were all there. When I think about it and look around, I was like, oh my gosh, I remember the day that like we were, we had, we had shot one scene and they were waiting for the crew to turn around. So I was like having a full on like long chit chat with Crystal or a long chit chat with Kat or a long chit chat with Leslie Odom or a long chit chat with Jesse Gray. Like we were just, you know, we were all there like doing this play, doing this TV show. But this thing inside the thing, you know, the play and the play and the TV show. I can't wait to smash the musical, honestly. <laughs> it's, you know it's coming. <laughs> you know it's coming. I want it. Talking about it. Or Marilyn the musical. I'll take either one. I'm not picking. <laughs> we have time for one last question. And I actually really like this question. This is from, hi, Laura. Laura asked, what one show can you not wait to see when Broadway opens again? Oh, there's so many things I was wanting to see. So forgive me because I want to say everything, but I will say I'm very excited to see a girl from the North Country. Um, I just a music and and I'm very interested to see like what that storytelling is and how it unfolds. There's so many more, honestly. And I was in the middle um, of a play myself when we went into quarantine. So I was like, as soon as I'm done doing my play, I'm gonna go to the theater because I love going to the theater. But that one comes to mind right away. There are so many more. Mm -hmm. So your, your play, All the Natalie Portmans, which was off Broadway in that beautiful new space on 52nd Street, it was like yeah. a cast of four, five people. And um, I'm watching and enjoying and waiting for Montego to come on stage. And then this like really haggard, old, bitter, you know, before her time done, woman gets on stage, and I'm like, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not I mean, I, 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 I didn't recognize, there was no Montego in that character. It was so crazy to me. Oh, it was so, so, good. 
So if it comes back, which it should, because you guys were extending and you had a sold out run and all the things, everybody should see all the Natalie Portmans because I'm calling it all the Montego Glovers. <laughs> <laughs> My name for the show. Good old Sue. Good old Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie Portman will be starring in that one, actually. <laughs> Oh, look, we'll reverse all. Flip it around. Thank you. You are so, we could talk all night. I mean, I feel like- Oh my gosh, you guys are the best. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I hope it was fun for you because it was super fun for me. You're a star. You're our star. Yeah, we really appreciate you. Thank you for being on with us. And um, uh, thank, thank you everybody for being on with us tonight. Yeah, thanks everybody. This is, this is a fun little interview. <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it. Coming back, and in the meantime, we've got Montego Glover for our very <laughs> own Tony Awards special. Thank you all so much. We'll see you soon. All right, bye guys. Bye, everybody. Bye.